We're joined now by Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez, philanthropist, graphic novelist, creative director, creator of La Bori Kenya, a superhero fighting climate doom and for the future of Puerto Rico. His work has been featured in the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History in D.C. Now it's on display at BU's exhibit title. We talked about this yesterday briefly. Comics is a medium, not a genre, viewable now through March 24th. And that's in addition to an exhibit with the Pennsylvania School of Art and Design, which also opened this week. Edgardo, not only is it great to meet you, I have to make an admission up front. I'm not into comics. This is fabulous. Your stuff, it really you. is. Your stuff is beautiful and strong and great. And it's really great to have you here. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank, thank you very much for being here. So tell, tell us about her, La Boring Kenya. What's her deal? So La Boring Kenya is an original character that I created in 2016. We're entering the seventh year of this series um, being published. And it was more of a response to the humanitarian crisis that was created by the austerity measures the economic crisis, and also the climate crisis affecting Puerto Rico. Now, those who follow um, environmental studies and sciences familiarly refer to the Caribbean islands as, in, in the Great Antilles as the Atlantic Basin or the Hurricane Basin. And yeah. for, for many years, scientists have been saying that Puerto Rico, uh, particularly a consortium of German scientists under the name German Watch, put together a comprehensive study that said Puerto Rico will be, unfortunately, seeing one climate disaster after another. And we've actually seen that. Because mm -hmm. just before the pandemic, there was a series of earthquakes that hit Puerto Rico. In fact, this is kind of like the third anniversary. We're literally in the midst of it right now, this month. And obviously, before that, it was Hurricane Maria. And then just recently, Hurricane Fiona. So the book was an opportunity to engage readers in a popular cultural genre of superhero storytelling because it's pretty much dominating everything in media. I mean, and, it, and it's everywhere from streaming platforms to toys to video games to underwear. Superheroes are everywhere, right? So I understood that and created this character with the symbolism and the iconography of superhero storytelling, even inspired by the work of um, Superman when it was first published by Jerry Siegel and Joe Shuster. And many people see this as a corporate icon, but when he was first published by these two Jewish American artists and writers, he was uh, in a story that was talking about anti-fascism, was uh, addressing domestic violence, and that was in the first issue that he appeared in Action Comics. So La Kenya is kind of like a throwback to the original um, volumes of comic books that really spoke to real issues. And before these comic book companies were a part of these multi-billion dollar empires that we see now producing content internationally, they were small independent publishing houses that literally just put together comic books that were we you, would get every week. Were you a comic book kid? Oh you my were, gosh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. So totally. tell us, what were you into when you were a little boy? Well, I was into Marvel and DC Comics. I was into superhero storytelling. Um, I especially loved Spider-Man um, for the same reason that Stan Lee referred to him as the everyman, because anyone could be Spider-Man under the mask. And we see that because this generation now embraces an Afro-Puerto Rican as Spider-Man, Miles Morales. Mm -hmm. So my two sons are looking at Spider-Man as a Puerto Rican. I grew up with Jewish... Uh, American Peter Parker. So we both have two different versions of the same character. You know, I wonder what kind of reaction you're getting from uh, people who live in Puerto Rico. It's an incredibly positive reaction, but not only in Puerto Rico, but across the diaspora. And while many people don't know, um, some years ago, the New York Times did a, a poll and they deduce that half of the American public don't even acknowledge or understand that Puerto Ricanos have been U.S. citizens for over a century Including now. a former president, by the way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And here in Boston, we have a historic community, uh, Via Victoria, that was created and fought for almost 50 years ago by Puerto Ricanos. And even though the area around it has developed and gentrified and displaced many, that still becomes a stronghold for Puerto Rican culture here in Boston. And that's reflective of the diaspora across the United States, and the response it has been incredibly positive. More so because Latinas, Puerto Ricanas are seeing themselves in a genre, in a medium that is dominated by white male narratives. Yep. So that, is, for me, is important because I'm entering into the space not only in, for philanthropic reasons, 
but also for storytelling purposes as well. Do you know, uh, yesterday we had on the show two guests who were the stars of Hamilton, which just opened the road company. Do you know from New York City, Pierre Jean Gonzalez? Do you have a relationship? No, but I know Lynn. Okay, well, I know Lynn Manuel. Know? Yeah. Oh, well, my God. Oh, my we're God. We're not related. Okay, oh my, okay. We're like, I mean, we're Puerto, we, we're, second, we're Puerto Rican, right? so we might be somehow yeah. related, but no, we're not well, related. Well, I was just going to ask you, I mean, I mean, he's like a total, complete genius. I've never seen anything like this musical. Nobody has. I and mean, everybody says it's the best thing they've ever seen. So, I mean, when you when you talk to him, do you have any idea that he's got a brain the size of, you know, Mount Everest or what? Well, he's, he's a consummate genius. He's constantly writing. He's constantly creating. And I think when you're in this headspace of being uh, a person of color in, in our nation, you have to raise the standard higher than your typical white male storyteller. You know, and I think that's what I've been finding myself to do. I don't have the platform that Lynn has, but in my small way, I'm entering into a field which is dominated by multi-billion dollar corporations that are publishing these yeah. books, and I'm doing it independently, but yet I'm still having this mainstream conversation with you both this afternoon, which shows that there's an intersectionality to the work that I'm doing that's making it more viable for these kinds of discourses. You know, before uh, Marjorie had a little stroke over uh, <laughs> Lin-Manuel Miranda a minute ago, Sorry. I mentioned Pierre Jean Gonzalez, who did a brilliant job as Hamilton in this road company. And one of the things we broached with him yesterday is while almost nobody has a critical word to say about Hamilton, the only critical thing I've ever heard, which we addressed to both guests, uh, was uh, what's up with uh, people of color playing white historical figures. And his response to that, I think, is exactly what your response is vis-a-vis -vis the importance of these, uh, car uh, these comics. Is he ba I'm paraphrasing him. He said it much more eloquently than I. He said, we finally, we're part of history. We finally get to see ourselves on the stage. It is totally natural and is long overdue. And when you think about the growth of the Latino population in this country, which is huge and one of the fastest growing populations, and I'm guessing, even though I don't have the data, the representation of Latinos in popular culture, there's a huge sort of disconnect. And oh, I'm guessing a major this disparity. is part of the hole you're trying to fill. There's right? a major disparity. The Annenberg Foundation recently produced studies that spoke specifically to this. There's an incredible disparity in the margin of consumers and representations. As the Latinx population, we are overwhelmingly underrepresented. And not just on the screen, on the page, um, in conversations. <laughs> In, in mainstream media, like even having the opportunity for us to be on the other side of the microphone as hosts of shows like this, for example, there's an underrepresentation. And oftentimes, we're relegated to Spanish language. But I'm a first generation Puerto Rican. English is my first language. And when stories are told, it's important that these stories reflect our experience as US citizens growing up in this nation, and that our stories aren't just international stories. So when we have the successful film of Encanto, it's a beautiful story, but it's set in Colombia. It's not set in Jackson Heights. And there are so many rich stories that can be told from the Latin experience here. I kind of like flipped that on its head with La Borinquena because the stories are told in Puerto Rico, but since Puerto Rico is a colony in the United States, everything that happens in Puerto Rico happens in the U.S. What kind of superpowers does she have? So the character is uh, based on the formula for superhero storytelling. Many people aren't aware, but superhero storytelling draws its inspiration from Greek, Norse, Roman mythology, even the Bible. I mean, Superman is basically Moses. So understanding that, I did some research and the indigenous peoples of the Caribbean islands, the greater Antilles, are the Tainos. The Tainos had their own belief system and they believed in goddesses and gods. They refer to them as semis. Atabe was a supreme goddess. So Atabe presents herself to La Borinquena when Marisol, who's her real name, finds these ancient artifact crystals that open up a portal and allow her to communicate with the goddesses and gods. And they provide her with elemental superpowers. So the Tainos were very connected to nature, very connected to the earth. So the powers are reflective of that. She can fly because she can manipulate the winds. She has superhuman strength that come from the seas and the mountains. And as a storyteller, I created the, a myth around the actual star itself, which allows her to communicate with these goddesses and gods. Tell us about some of the other great characters. Louis, Sophia, describe some of the players in this beautiful construct you put together. Well, one of the things that I really enjoy about storytelling, and I recall there was actually uh, an article written by The Guardian when they first um, reviewed our first book when it was published in 2016, and they referred to it as an incredibly multi-diverse cast of characters. 
But oftentimes, when people don't understand how diverse organically the Latinx community is, they will say things like that. We're an ethnic group that comprises of indigenous, African, Asian, and European. So we look like us here. We look like this studio audience here. We're, we're, we're a range, a rainbow. So the characters are reflective of that. And so one of the characters is actually getting her own spin-off series this year, Luz La Luminosa. Um, Luz is actually a character of Asian Latinx origin, because what many people aren't aware of, in the early 1800s, when the Chinese Exclusionary Act was introduced here in the United States, the most xenophobic act in the history of the United States, the immigration of Asians didn't stop. And although it was the Chinese Exclusionary Act, it excluded all Asians because nobody was checking to see if you were Korean or Vietnamese at the, at the border. So Chinese and other Asians continue to immigrate to the Americas. And there's about a 0.5% of the Latino population in Latin America, South America and the Caribbean identify as Asian. So we created a character to also reflect that. Sophia is actually an activist in the story because we need to have characters that also don't have superhero powers. But what's great about this character that I wrote in the series is that we see her evolution from someone who exhibits a form of colorism in her vernacular to someone who's actually kind of like embracing the reality of what it is to live in a colony in 2023. You've also uh, been very involved in raising money, nonprofits for Puerto Rico. Tell us about that. So we had this amazing opportunity just weeks after Hurricane Maria. I was at the New York Comic Con and I had a chance meeting with Dan DiDio, <laughs> then publisher of DC Comics who had a conversation with me about our work, because at the time, and even to this day, we're the only comic book series that actually has a Puerto Rican woman as a lead, the, literally the titular character of the book. After this conversation with DC Comics, we came to an understanding that we should do a crossover book. This crossover book would be called Reconstruction. It won me the comic book industry's highest honor, the Eisner for the humanitarian work. It became a number one bestseller for four months straight wow. on Amazon. Wow. Helped us raise a quarter of a million dollars, which we invested to create a grants program. Because oftentimes in, 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 a, in a crisis, in a disaster, there's an immediate response. It's part of our human nature, but it's also part of our human nature to forget. Mm -hmm. So after a few weeks, it leaves the new cycle. In fact, when Hurricane Fiona hit Puerto Rico this last fall, within a few weeks, the new cycle took us across the ocean to England to address the Queen's funeral. And Puerto Rico was completely forgotten in this discourse. So our work is reflective and understands that. So we've created this fund that for the last six years, we've been using to award microgrants to nonprofits. So we're returning to Puerto Rico in April to do another series of grants that we'll be awarding. And we just recently announced an RFP, a request for proposals so that nonprofits in Puerto Rico can actually apply with their ideas and that we can support it. So we're easily the only superhero series that is directly connected to social justice in the space of philanthropic Speaking work. Speaking of social justice, voting is social justice. Is Rosario Dawson a buddy of yours? I would like to call Rosario, like, she has various titles of me. She's an hermana, she's my sister, she's an ally, she's a fan. I recall about six years ago, she reached out to me personally and I got this blind call um, from her and she said, hi, it's Rosario, oh I want gosh. to have a, a La Boringueña costume made. I'm, sorry, I'm like, uh, you can't exactly go to Target and get it off the <laughs> rack, so, Not yet. but I can help you out. And, and within a day, literally within 24 hours, she had a costume made, she was on Sunset Boulevard for Halloween, dressed up as La Boringueña. So Rosario has been working with us for many years doing a lot of public service announcements. Mention what she did. We're going to play it in a second. Mention what she did in Georgia during the runoff so in 2021. So Rosario Dawson co-founded Voto Latino, which is a nonprofit organization that does voter advocacy and voter education across the United States. And I like to call it uh, or nuestro granito de arena, like our little grain of sand that actually pushed the voter turnout. Historically, this was the largest voter turnout in the last general election from the Latinx community in the history. This the is United Ossoff States. and Warnock in that critical election. Right. Yes. Here's, a, here's a little piece of the PSA with the great Rosario Dawson. Here it is. Georgia's runoff election is today. It's January 5th, 2021. I'm La Borinquena, and I've teamed up with Voto Latino to ensure that Latinx Georgians line up to vote in this runoff election. 
Today, our vote in Georgia is how we use our power. We will not waste one vote. We are making a difference in this runoff election. I love that. Thank you. You know, Edgardo, I wondered, you mentioned, you know, the, the lack of representation of Latinos in media and, and, and theater and all this kind of stuff. But this does seem, you know, Superman, Catwoman, this seems like a natural movie to me. <laughs> and especially, and I just From wonder, your lips, he's thinking, well, right? But, I, but you do wonder how much um, bias there is against doing something, even though the population, as you say, is, is growing so much, so largely, the Latinx community. It's all about value. Yeah. And it's about who those, um, who are literally making the deals, who are the ones that are literally opening the doors, right? And if they don't have and see an inherent value in our audience and our community, they don't see an inherent value in our stories. But these studies show that, you know, we are, as a, as a, as a people in the U.S., the, one of the largest consumer populations. Yeah. We are close to 30% of the box office draw, but we're less than like 5% of the actual characters. And we're talking about secondary and tertiary characters that when we actually are on the screen. You don't see stories where we're the lead. Mm -hmm. And when we do see stories, we don't see stories that speak to our experience living here in the United States. Again, just to reiterate, we see these international stories like the, the, the Netflix tape Narcos, mm -hmm. which all, and oftentimes the stories tend to center around vilified narratives of the Latin experience when some, many of us are storytellers, librarians, scientists, and run, you know, it's like, no, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about Narcos. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Edgardo, Marjorie's gonna give the website in a minute when we bid you farewell, but before we do, we briefly mentioned the BU thing that's running through March 24th. Tell us a little bit about what's happening there. Well, that's an incredible exhibition that was curated by Professor Joel Christian Gill at Boston University. And it's quite easily the most comprehensive collection of US published comic books for close to the last 100 years, really? including La Wurinquena, but also the first comic strip ever illustrated and written by Charles Schultz, which, oh, was, which is on loan that's from the Library great. of Congress. So I implore everyone to check it out. It's a free exhibition. It's at 855 Commonwealth. and. Uh, it's probably gonna blow you away because like the title, comic books aren't just uh, a, a genre. In fact, it, there's nothing but multiple genres in this industry. And, and La Buenquena is literally like the only thing that's superhero in that exhibition. You're gonna actually see how diverse this actual medium of storytelling is. Your work is, is fabulous and thank really you. Thank exciting. You so much. It's a pleasure yeah. to meet you. Thank you so much for thank coming Thank you today. very, very much thank thank you. You. for being with great. us, Edgardo. We've been speaking with Edgardo Miranda Rodriguez, creator of La Borinquena series. If you want to buy one of his books, which support philanthropic work in Puerto Rico, visit laborinquena.com. I'm going to spell There's a hyphen in there, though, right? Is I'm there not? Spell yeah, it's not? Yeah, la dash. Well, is that a hyphen or a dash when it's raised Same up? Same thing. Is it? Okay. It's in, the, it's in the middle. It's not the one that's down it below. Is. Thank you. But I'm going to spell it for you. It's B is in boy, O R. I N Q U E N is Nancy A dot com, uh, laborincania.com. And you can also check out Comics is a Medium, Not a Genre at BU Stone Gallery through March 24th. That's Boston University. Thank you, Edgardo, very really much. Good and to congratulations. Both. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Really After a quick break, we're going to talk about the big quit finally hitting New Zealand with Prime Minister Jacinda Alhern opting to step down after a commendable six-year run. We'll get thoughts from media maven Sue O'Connell on that and on the involuntary manslaughter charges brought against Alec Baldwin, plus the latest on George Santos. Now, apparently, he's a Brazilian drag queen as well as his other activities. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Mm. 